Hi, I'm Richard Sever, editor of Cold Spring Harbor Perspectives. With me I have Dan Lippman from NYU School of Medicine. Dan, welcome to Cold Spring Harbor. It's great to be here. Welcome to a very hot Cold Spring <laughs> Harbor, almost 90 degrees. Yeah, but the setting is beautiful, so I'm very happy to be here. Well, I, I hope you're enjoying the meeting. Yes, very much. Now, later in the week, you're going to be talking um, about interactions between the immune system and um, our microbiota in our gut. Um, and but before we get to your own recent work, can you just set the scene for us a little bit about the microbiome? I mean, we have, what, 100 trillion bugs in our guts? Roughly 100 trillion bacteria, probably also a lot of viruses that have not yet been characterized, fungi. Uh, and uh, we've known about this for a very long time, and I think we've appreciated for a very long time that, uh, that this microbiome, uh, which is the entire genetic makeup uh, of all the microbiota, of all the all microorganisms in the gut, uh, have a huge influence on uh, metabolism, on uh, uh, nutrition, on vitamin uh, 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 uptake, uh, as well as production of vitamins. Uh, but there hasn't been quite as much attention to the interaction with the immune system. Right. And I think that that has only come to the fore uh, over the maybe the last decade. There's been a lot of work since, I believe, the 1960s uh, on uh, uh, nautobiotic mice, mice that are rendered germ-free and then colonized uh, with uh, restricted uh, uh, strains of bacteria uh, or uh, very well-defined populations of bacteria. So there has been a recognition from that early work that there is uh, an effect on the immune system. But it's uh -huh. only recently, because of new tools that have become available, that it's now possible to really understand this mutualistic relationship in much better detail. Uh huh. So I mean, so these these are essentially harmless, and and we benefit from them as a symbiotic relationship. I think in the on the large part, uh, uh, on most part, it is uh, a, a these are harmless bacteria. But one has to be cautious because they can become harmful if they are uh, if they are present in an imbalanced uh, kind of. Uh, uh, ecological uh, environment. So, for example, there are certain bacteria that are uh, that are kept at a particularly low level uh, in a in a healthy uh, type of microbiota, uh, and uh, if they now expand uh, or if they maybe turn on certain metabolic processes, certain enzymes that we don't really understand yet, they can now become harmful. And that's what uh -huh. we're trying to understand more of. Uh -huh. So, so, so for most of these ba bacteria, how does how does the immune system discriminate between the sort of the resident bacteria that you know it's okay with, mm -hmm. and you know the sorts of bacteria that produce you know food poisoning? What's the distinct? And right. then you know these smaller right. populations you're talking about that where yes. it's the level rather than the nature of the bacterium that's presumably right. the case. Well, I think there are multiple levels of compartmentalizing the uh, microbial load uh, in the lumen of the intestine. Uh, on the surface of the intestinal epithelial cells uh, and the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the region of the gut called the lamina propria, which uh -huh. is a region underneath the single cell layer of epithelium that is found throughout the intestine. Uh, and it's in the lamina propria that there are a lot of cells of the immune system, particularly uh, more prominent in certain parts of the intestine, like the uh, end part of the small intestine, where there's a lot more uh, a, a lot, there are a lot more cells of the immune system present there. Uh, so one way that uh, this compartmentalization occurs is through, uh, through the epithelium itself that will allow certain bacteria to penetrate, hopefully uh, bacteria that are uh, beneficial, may have access uh, to the, uh, uh, to the uh, lamina propria to stimulate uh, potentially useful branches of the immune system. Uh, either directly or indirectly through their products. And, uh, uh, and also there's a layer of mucin that will, separate, that will keep out the vast majority of bacteria from ever getting close to the epithelium. Now pathogenic bacteria typically have toxins, have means of making their way through the mucin layer, getting through the epithelium uh, in a way that's obviously not beneficial. Uh -huh. uh, but we, have to, we do have to recognize both. And it's still not terribly well understood how we really discriminate between them. Uh, but what I think is becoming clear is that on top of this kind of compartmentalization mechanism, which is physical, there's also a functional uh, means of compartmentalizing, and that is that there are signals received by the cells of the immune system from the healthy microbiota that basically prevent the migration of both uh, 
beneficial and potentially harmful bacteria through the epithelium to reach the sites where the immune system can be primed. So what's the nature of these? So these are, these are chemicals released by the bacteria for, for what purpose specifically to well, we're not sure. Well, we're immune not system. exactly sure how the signals are transmitted. We, it does look like they require a particular signaling molecule that is found in the innate immune system, the so-called MITE 88 molecule. Uh, but what is being recognized exactly is, is not absolutely clear. But what we do know is that in the absence of this kind of a signal, uh, or if you just treat animals with antibiotics, now the remaining bacteria can be taken up by mm. uh, uh, certain sentinel cells that sit uh, just under the epithelium in the lamina propria and transport these bacteria to the lymph nodes that drain uh, the uh, small intestine. And there, in the lymph node, initiate an immune response, both T lymphocytes and B lymphocytes. Uh -huh. So potentially that is a mechanism of, uh, of inflammation when this kind of... Uh, uh, restraint of the sentinel cells is not in place. So, so I mean, you, you, you mentioned earlier on circumstances in which the levels of some bacteria might rise and then presumably this could lead to um, the effects you're talking about. W what's the precipitating event that might cause this? Well, I think there are environmental events and then there are genetic uh, factors. Mm -hmm. uh, environmental events you might think of, obviously antibiotic use, which is so prevalent in, uh, in the world these days. Uh, toxins, uh, infections with pathogenic bacteria that may allow, the, that may actually be controlled, but then may, may potentially bias the normally healthy bacteria to exist in a different, uh, in a different kind of balance. Um, so those are, uh, and even food uh, uh -huh. can, can influence uh, the types of bacteria that, uh, that we do have uh, in the lumen. And obviously on the genetic side, there is the uh, immune system, both innate branches as I was mentioning, you know, this MITE 88 signal that basically keeps uh, uh, the bacteria from penetrating, uh, as well as adaptive immune cells, uh, which we primarily work on, uh, such as T lymphocytes, uh, that basically, uh, uh, if there are defects in these kinds of branches, then that can lead to a, uh, to a uh, disproportionate increase in some potentially harmful bacteria. It's a process people call dysbiosis, uh, that is, basically a dysregulation of the normal symbiotic relationship uh -huh. uh, of the beneficial bacteria and our, our uh, uh, and the host organism. Uh, in your abstract, you, um, you mentioned one specific um, cell type, Th17 cells. Right. So could you, for those of us who didn't keep up with Th3 through to Th16 cells, <laughs> can you um, remind us what exactly Th17 cells are? I'm not aware that are? there are Th3 through Th16. Uh, actually, there's Th1 and Th2, which, uh, Bob Kaufman and Tim Mossman described in the early 1980s, uh, and they really set the, the paradigm for uh, different functional specification of T lymphocytes. And it's, uh, it was more than about 20 years later that it became clear that there's another cell type, so a type that makes a cytokine called IL-17. Mm -hmm. Actually, there are two, IL-17A and F, that are closely related, and it's because of that that these cells were called TH17. Right. Um, but these cells, uh, gained prominence very rapidly uh, because uh, uh, it was recognized that uh, uh, they have key roles in a number of inflammatory diseases, of autoimmune diseases. And I think the earliest evidence uh, that was really powerful evidence came from work at uh, what was then the Dnex Institute. Uh, Dan Kua and Bob Castelline and their uh, colleagues there found that uh, that in mice that were defective for being able to make Th17 cells because they lacked another cytokine required for these to form, uh, these animals were no longer susceptible to autoimmune diseases like models for multiple sclerosis, models for arthritis, various models for uh -huh. colitis. Uh, so, so these cells are, uh, are potentially inflammatory, uh, but in the gut we think they perform a very beneficial function, which is to uh, basically keep the a microbiota in a healthy balance. And also, uh, we think in case there are uh, infections with uh, potentially har harmful microbes like uh, uh, enteropathic E. coli uh, that we hear about occasionally as uh, contaminating uh, the food chain, uh, that uh, these Th17s can actually uh, cope with these and, uh, and cl help clear those bacteria. What they do is they make uh, the cytokines like IL-17 A and F help attract uh, phagocytic cells, 
neutrophils uh, into the lamina propria, and uh, uh, in, and these neutrophils can uh, then basically kill up the uh, kill many of the bacteria that uh, will infiltrate. Right, and so uh, I mean, you mentioned autoimmune disease before. Um, what's their role in that? Do they run a mark? Is that is that the issue? That is thought to be the case, and uh, and now in humans there is very good uh, genetic evidence. Uh, uh, for example, in Crohn's disease, there are mutations in the pathway for the Th17, uh, for Th17 development uh, that can contribute to uh, either more susceptibility or protection uh, from Crohn's disease. Uh, and even, even more uh, clear is, uh, are, uh, uh, even more clear evidence for this comes from results in therapeutic, uh, uh, in the therapeutic arena, where antibodies against uh, interleukin-23 which is a stimulator of Th17 cells, or against IL-17, are very highly effective in treating uh, psoriasis. Uh -huh. so, so we think that basically, when these cells do run amok through mechanisms we don't particularly understand very well at this point, uh, that, uh, that can lead to uh, inflammation, not immune disease. Okay, so, um, so a consequence of um, bad diet could ultimately be autoimmune disease? Oh, potentially. Uh, uh, potentially it could be, and there's even been some suggestions that uh, even uh, uh, molecules, even such as salt, can influence Th17 uh -huh. cell differentiation. We don't know if that really occurs in the human population, but certainly in mouse models one can demonstrate that the Th17 differentiation pathway uh, is subject to many environmental kinds of uh, perturbations. Uh -huh. and, and so if one could adjust um, one's microbiota, that might be a potential um, That is the solution. hope. The hope is that one could adjust the microbiota to strike the right balance between these kinds of pro-inflammatory cells and the other very important cell type that's also found in the intestine, T-cell type, which are the regulatory T-cells. And there's now evidence that different bacteria can influence the expansion or differentiation of either T-helper-17 cells or T-regs. Uh -huh. So if we can understand these bacteria in human, the ones in human that do this job much better, we might be able to manipulate them either by changing the microbiota in individuals or eventually even, uh, uh, even treating uh, people uh, orally with uh, certain bioactive molecules that are produced by, uh, by various bacteria. Oh, okay. So, well, it sounds like um, probiotic yogurt is the solution for years to come. So. Well, I mean, I, I think that the, the kinds of probiotics that we currently have uh, commercially available are not terribly well understood. Uh -huh. They're, they may have some uh, slight benefit in certain cases, uh, but they are not uh, rationally designed yogurts. And okay. I, I think in the future, I think 10 years from now, we probably will have rationally designed yogurts that can be uh, that, that can really be beneficial in striking the right balance uh, between these different cells in the immune system. Okay, well that sounds like uh, a, a nice place to end. The future <laughs> is rationally designed yoga. Dan, you know? it's been very nice talking okay, to you. Okay, it's great to, great to great. be here. Thank you. Great.